Hello, this video is about promoting conversation skills in children who are already verbal, uh, but may need some help developing their skills so that they can build positive social relationships with others. Um, we need to recognise that in our school, although some children might be able to be quite verbal, they might not understand the rules. Um, that govern our conversations. And to be fair, it's something that we all need to work out from time to time. We don't always make perfect sense with each other. So this video outlines the kind of support we give in school um, to children who need this kind of help. And the first thing that we talk about is why we need to talk. Um, why do we build rapports, those close understandings with other people? And that's really because we uh, are social animals and we need not to feel alone in the world. But it's also because we need to share information with each other so that we can organise ourselves, uh, to share feelings so we can feel close and understood, uh, to get things done. And of course, uh, communication is central to teaching and learning. So it's very important. So we spend a bit of time uh, um, discussing, demonstrating what rapport looks like and what a rapport might be between various people and how it differs from person to person depending on the relationship. But essentially it's being on the same page as somebody else and it's crucial to friendships. The more that you develop rapports with other people, the more likely you are to become friends with them. And so therefore it's a, a crucial way of making friends to go out, meet people and develop rapports with them. So we spend quite a lot of time practicing that, looking at um, that in either stories or films. And we stress that this is something that we all need to work out. And yeah, it can take a lot of work. It doesn't always just happen naturally. So we look at how do you develop rapport? Um, we look at the role of small talk. That's hi, how are you? What did you get on? Uh, what did you do last night? Or terrible weather today, isn't it? Why is that important to rapport? Um, I'll come back to small talk in a minute. We look at how important how important it is to share the agenda that there's no sudden changes of agenda, that you might be locked in your thoughts, but you've got to consider the thoughts of the other person now. And so you've got to signal changes of agenda and agree them. Um, this is quite difficult sometimes um, for adults as well as children. So it takes a lot of practice. But if children can think about this and understand that they've got to stay on one topic for a while, um, because the other person's not ready to move on yet, then they have more chance of developing the rapport. We look at active listening, what it actually means to be an active listener. So we practice eye contact, we practice body posture, how close you need to be to the other person. Um, we look at uh, active listening involving nodding and showing that you've understood. And we also look at avoiding those conversation killers that destroy rapport um, almost in an instant. We'll come back to that as well. From now, let's go on to small talk. So small talk often gets written off as a bit of a waste of time, but in fact, it's really important to um, develop a relationship with somebody else. So we're never going to go to somebody and talk to them about something really important straight away. We start off with safe topics like the weather or what are you doing at the weekend, just to establish that give and take, the asking and listening to answers and then offering information ourselves so that the conversation develops and turn taking is established and then we can um, get on to what's really important. 
So we practice that a lot. We have little competitions to see whether uh, children can do small talk with a member of staff uh, or then with another um, of their friends. And we see how long they can do it for and we practice and suggest ways of continuing until they um, can do it for a couple of minutes independently, hopefully. And we also then encourage it in the lunch hall or in the playground or in other uh, social situations. We also look out for conversation killers, things which just make uh, it difficult to share a rapport. So in the cartoon there, the, the guy's talking about one thing, but the other guy's understanding another completely different thing because they're just not connecting. And so conversation killers include labeling um, or analyzing or judging. So listening to somebody and saying, oh, well, that sounds like you've got a problem or, oh, that's stupid or, God, I wouldn't do that. All of those are conversation killers. Telling people what to do. We practice listening and not offering solutions. And to be fair, lots of adults find that really difficult. So we understand our children are not going to be able to do that naturally straight away. So the others making demands, insincere praise, closed questions. You need to be asking, we want our children to be asking open questions, not just like, not just, um, did you go to the cinema at the weekend? Yes or no, but what did you do at the weekend? Um, tell me about it. Is a much more open question that allows the um, person you're speaking with to make some choices about what they want to talk about. So patronizing or changing the subject, um, which we've talked around about already, these are conversation killers. And perhaps the most common mistake, again, that adults make as much as children is to make the conversation all about themselves and not do enough um, exploring what the other person's opinions and experiences have been like. We then spend quite a lot of time getting children to learn how to stand up for themselves. If we could do this um, successfully, there would be very few behavior problems in the playground. But unfortunately, children are like adults and we find standing up for ourselves quite difficult. So we talk about three ways of talking. Firstly, there's the wimpy way, where you don't actually say what you really want to say. You either avoid it because you don't like confrontation or you're scared of um, actually working out how unhappy you are with something. So you just stay with being polite or not saying anything at all. And unfortunately, the more we do that, the more we tend to end up becoming aggressive, where we say what we want to say, but we say it too much and too aggressively. And we teach that wimpy and aggressive ways of speaking are problematic, but mainly because they don't, you don't get what you want if you're wimpy or if you're aggressive. If you're wimpy, nobody knows what you want. If you're aggressive, people start just seeing it as a fight situation, so they're not going to give you what you want. If you want to convince people to do things in the way that you want them to do it, you need to become assertive. So we talk about this middle ground of being strong, clear, kind and polite, but direct as well. So you do tell people if you're upset with them, but you do it in a polite and kind way. This needs a lot of practice. So we talk about the magic script, which is a, a sort of golden way of being assertive. If you've got somebody, I don't know, calling you a silly name and you say to them, don't call me that, it's horrible. You're giving them space to say, I'm only joking. It's not horrible, it's just a bit of fun. 
So we teach this magic script, which you just use these words and fill in the gaps. When you call me that name, I feel sad. And that's a much more effective way of communicating your feelings because nobody can argue with your feelings. So when you feel when you call me that name, I feel sad and I'd like you to stop, please. Perfect assertive sentence. And uh, yeah, one that's not going to provoke further conflict and it's going to make your feelings clear. So we do spend a bit of time practicing resolving conflicts. And here's a visual way of being. Um, and the mouse is the wimpy, the monster is the aggressive, and the me hopefully is the assertive um, way. And we look at finding win-win situations for solving arguments. And we do this in lessons, but also we do it when there has been an argument in the playground. We get people calmed down and we work out what people wanted to do originally. And often it's something that's pro-social or something that they wanted to do, like play football together. But they were either a bit too aggressive or wimpy. The conversation didn't flow properly and people got defensive and then uh, arguments and difficult feelings took over. So using real life situations to teach these skills is really Im Im important um, and effective way of, of getting these skills across. If children are really getting these skills, we maybe put them in a situation where they are counseling people with, you know, we can act out as, that we've got problems and we put them in the role of counselor or we put them in the role of radio host. People, these are situations where people need to use really advanced skills to uh, um, make sure that things flow properly because they are the ones in control of the uh, radio show or the counseling session. So it's their responsibility to make sure conversations flow smoothly and are effective. But it's, that's just two examples of the kind of role play that we do to promote these skills. That's more or less it. Thank you for listening. Um, we do link these conversation skills to other areas. It's difficult to have good conversation skills unless you're adept at uh, recognising your emotions and managing your emotions. And once you start to learn how to resolve conflicts, you your, that bleeds into learning how to manage your anger or anxiety. We do get asked, how can I have a boyfriend or girlfriend? And we link that back to friendship and all relationships. And all relationships are built on those good conversation skills. So we do practice how to listen, how to learn, how to relax, and even how to be creative. Some of these will feature in other videos that we will produce. But for now, thank you for listening and goodbye.